I'm starting. Are you starting? I'm starting. Okay. <laughs> dust everywhere. Where'd all this dust come from? I've got oh. microphone cobwebs. <laughs> There's spiders crawling on the ceiling. <laughs> where, where, where'd all this come from? How long has it been? It has to it has to have been at least a month. At least a month. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'll be honest, if it wasn't for my wife, this episode wouldn't be happening at all. <laughs> That's right. The lovely Laura back at hard at work. Researching yes. crazy stories from the Nakanomicon annals. Yes, uh, my uh, dear research assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am Benjamin Junior Wandio, and I am here with my dad. Todd. Dirty Clyde. Todd, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Todd, Dirty Clyde Wandio. Yeah, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, it is a, f- a bright and early Monday morning here in frosty Edmonton. Um, yeah. It's what, minus 10, minus 11? Yeah, not bad, though. I mean, it's going to be plus four tomorrow, so. Oh, God. <laughs> I know. Back and forth, back and forth. Well, and it also just snowed like half a foot. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. How many centimeters is that? 15? I don't know. March is always <clears throat> weird. Yeah, March is super weird. Um, yeah, we are back, at least for this episode. We'll probably be back yeah. in another couple weeks with another one. But um, before we get started, why don't we just uh, start by pitching our Patreon, patreon.com slash Um You can also find us on ko-fi.com slash where you can support us with a one-time gift of coffee. Um, and also, if you are insane and don't sleep on uh, Friday nights, um, starting at 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time, you can watch me play video games <laughs> on uh, twitch.tv slash casual coffee night. Night spelled is it, N-I-T-E. <laughs> yeah. is, it, is it one of those ones where you're just sitting there going, oh, fracking, was it, I can't get, oh, oh, and then you throw the, <laughs> throw the controller at the TV? <laughs> no, I actually try to keep really chill and have like a little conversation hmm. with my hmm. listeners. Um, last time I talked to a guy from, oh, where was it? Uh, the Czech Republic, I think. About uh, his favorite hot beverage, which was cocoa. Oh, nice. (laughs) Uh, I just get really bored on Friday nights. Um, I suppose I could be doing research, but... You could be, yeah, working on our next uh, amazing podcast. That's right. Uh, Well, anyways, I knew this one was well in hand by my, my dear and lovely wife. So why don't... We get right into it. Yeah, three minutes and 50 seconds in. (laughs) (laughs) That's not even that bad. (laughs) That's not bad. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of people just listen to podcasts for the blather at the beginning and end of an episode. (laughs) That's not untrue. (laughs) As soon as you have the, oh, history, yawn. (laughs) Well, I think we have a pretty exciting slice of history for us here today. So, why don't we begin back down in the cotton plantation outside of Georgetown, South Carolina, sometime between 1845 and 1850. There a man was born a slave. We don't know precisely when, but we... I mean, keeping in mind, slave births were very seldom a thing of note. Um, But we do know that this man was freed after the Civil War in 1865. And after he was freed, he began a long drift westward, trying to put as much distance between himself and his former life on the cotton plantation. This man was named John Ware. 
He was illiterate, and thus most of what we know about him comes from posthumous interviews with his friends and family. We know that uh, after he was freed, he started looking for any work he could get. He did odd jobs here and there, working as a laborer, um, and eventually winds up in Fort Worth, Texas, where a rancher named Murphy Blandon is impressed by John Ware's easygoing demeanor and impressive build, giving him a job despite his complete lack of experience working with animals. <laughs> you know, you're not far off. Uh, hmm? <laughs> um, unsurprisingly, he was hired as what was called a dragman, which was considered the worst job you could get as a as a cattleman at the time, a cowboy, if you will. Um, dragmen would ride behind the herds and would round up any stray cattle and calves and push them back into the herd. Uh, so you're not just like riding kind of amidst the herd or on the sides like you see in a lot of like the old westerns and stuff. This was the guy who had like dart back and forth every time a cow got out of line and was tragging behind. They'd have to push him back. Oh yeah, all the dust, all the, the cow shit, everything was just unpleasant back there. Um, yeah. So... At this time, the invention of barbed wire was still a few years away, and its broad implementation probably about a decade away. This is important. Barbed wire is actually what led to the end of the so-called open-range era of cattle farming, um, and would basically be the death of kind of what we imagined cowboys to be. Um, after barbed wire comes into role into place, um, herds are confined to a single ranch to prevent overgrazing of the surrounding land. And it also provided security against rustlers. It's a lot harder to get a cow out and it gives you a much easier area to patrol. So kind of that whole kind of mythical image we have of the cowboy comes from this brief period where Broad cattle farming was common, as well as there being no set ranch lands. Yeah, you'd you'd have to get your cattle to market. There, yeah, this is before the rail railway, and um, so you know you'd take your cattle after after barbed wire and you know fenced properties and all that. Free grazing was uh, the way to go. Yeah, because you didn't have to pay for feed. Nope. And you'd simply move your cattle uh, to to where they to the feedlot or to the uh, killing lots. Yeah, and, and at this time, this is also a sweet spot between um, kind of mass cattle farming mm -hmm. and barbed wire creating fenced ranches. Right. This is a, a because before this, farmers would typically keep like a handful of cows, uh, mostly for their own use. And they would sell the excess meat and hides on the market, but that wasn't the primary reason you kept a cow. It was mostly for you. Yeah. Um, but as people pushed further west and populations grew, more people are living in cities now. Um, there becomes a demand for meat that wasn't really there before. And so there was this push for these kind of much larger herds and no way to really keep them penned in. Uh, Wood fence does nothing to stop a cow. It's like a suggestion. Barbed wire is too, but it at least hurts. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's cost prohibitive to put up a wood fence around a ranch. Yeah. Just because of the amount of land like, you would need to graze cattle. Yeah, and barbed wire is easy. You just plug down a peg and wrap some wire around it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um... So many freed slaves would turn to the life of a cowboy as it involved skills they were often familiar with, didn't require a formal education, and the lonely life often kept them out of scrapes with the less open-minded sect of the American population. On top of that, cowboys were already considered to be kind of the bottom of the social ladder, and so it wasn't like they were super picky about who they hired as cowboys. 
Um, estimates put the number of African Americans among the Cowboys at this time at around 15%, closer to 25% in the region around Texas, and much lower the further northwest you got, uh, especially towards Oregon, which was being founded as a whites-only state at this time. Um, yeah, <laughs> Oregon, Oregon has a very mixed up history. Interesting. Um, yeah. Cow- so, in, and if you were a person of color and a cowboy, you were even lower on the social ladder. And so working as one could be pretty difficult, but oftentimes it was the only work you could get. And that was definitely the case with John Ware. Mm-hmm. By the 1870s, John Ware had actually begun to make a bit of a name for himself as a cowboy in the U.S. and was working pretty steadily. Um, Cattle driving is hard work. Cattle at this time are raised in a sort of semi-feral state on the open range and had to be rounded up on occasion. Through the course of a day, a cowboy would go through three or four fresh horses through the day's work. Young cattle had to be roped and branded, and in the case of most males, while they were roped, you also castrated them. Mm -hmm. So, John managed to keep getting work. In 1879, uh, Sir Hugh Allen's Northwest Cattle Company contracted him as part of a team to bring a herd of 3,000 cattle from the U.S. to southern Alberta which at this time was called the Northwest Territories. He was hired to work as a dragman, despite his experience at this point, and along the way befriended another cowboy named Bill Moody. That name sounds familiar. Uh, it might. I don't, I don't know why it would, but I mean, it's also one of those very cowboy names. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look. Uh, there is an actor named Bill Moody who was uh, born in 1949, died June 8th, 2012. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I actually this saw, is a different Bill. I Moody. saw him at the at the Citadel, I believe. At, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so in 1882, a Quebecer named Fred Stimson moves to Alberta and buys the Bar U ranch that's bar dash letter u ranch um that herd of cattle that he was driving from uh, the u.s was ultimately destined for this ranch and so fred stimson hires bill moody who as a condition of his employment requires stimson to also hire john ware stimson reluctantly agrees Keep in mind, John Ware is an experienced cattle hand at this point. Mm-hmm. He's been doing this for at least nine years. But but because of the so. color of his skin, people, <clears throat> so he has to hire on with yeah. someone else. Yeah. Uh. Stimson manages to overlook John Ware's years of experience and instead focuses on the fact that he's an illiterate black man and employs him as a night hawk, guarding the herd at night. Nighthawks were also often known to sing to the herds in order to keep them calm. Um, Stimson gives Ware uh, the crappiest horse he owns, and Ware sets out on the trail. Along the way, he requests a better horse, and they give him an ill-tempered bronco that none of the other cowboys could ride. He's told that if he can ride it, you can keep it. (laughs) (laughs) Is that so, is that the beginning of his rodeo days? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ware shrugs, agrees, and takes the horse. He's a giant of a man with a remarkably calm temperament, and he actually manages to bring the Bronco under control. This suitably impresses his co-workers, and he finally arrives in Alberta with the herd, having impressed his employers enough to be promoted to the day crew and works at the Bar U until 1884, when he moves over to the Corn Ranch, located on the Sheep River just south of Calgary near Okotoks. At the Corn, he starts out as a ranch hand caring for the cattle. After a while, however, he is actually moved up and uh, starts caring for Corn's horses instead. 
Um, he just becomes such a proficient animal handler that he gets a promotion, basically. No. Oh. Yeah. In 1884 and 85, he actually joins a group of cowboys from Fort McLeod who are doing what's called a roundup in the Rockies. Mm-hmm. Now, a roundup. Do you know what a roundup is? Well, I'm assuming that's when all the smaller uh, ranchers pool all of their cattle together to take to market. Not quite. Okay. A roundup is when a group of cowboys will actually go out and search a region for lost cattle. Okay. Any unbranded cattle that are found during this roundup are considered fair game and can go to whoever brings them in. This is where Ware actually gets his first cows and registers his own brand, the Four Nines. Literally <laughs> just nine 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 nine. So this is how Ware actually starts his own herd, is by going on this roundup uh, in the Rockies near Fort McLeod. In 1890, Ware had actually amassed enough cattle from doing roundups and from purchases to actually start his own ranch, which he called the Four Nines, near Millerville, southwest-west of Calgary, just north of the Black Diamonds. Okay, yeah. He re-registers his brand in 1898 as the Three Nines instead. <laughs> four Nines <laughs> Four Nines kept burning the cattle to death. <laughs> Jeez, I probably couldn't afford that yeah, that much wrought iron. <laughs> On December 29th, 1892, he marries the Toronto-born Mildred Lewis, a black woman who, uh, together with him, had six children, five of whom survived to adulthood, which is actually pretty good odds for that That's remarkable. (laughs) Yeah. Um, In 1902, he builds a new ranch on the Red Deer River, north of Brooks. It was destroyed shortly after in a spring flood But, undeterred, he builds on higher ground. Unfortunately, Ware didn't get to enjoy the home long. In 1905, his wife contracts pneumonia and typhoid. She passes away shortly after. He sends his children to live with her parents in Blairville. Later that year, his horse trips in a badger hole, falling on him and killing him. Well. Yeah. They died a cowboy's death. Well, I guess so. He died in the saddle. Right. Well, that's how that's how a lot of cowboys go. Is their horse falls on them. Yeah. Well, no doubt. Um, that's one ton of animal. <laughs> yeah, that's a it's a big beast. Yeah. Ware was highly respected in the area as a cowboy, and his funeral was attended by ranchers and cowboys from all over. Two of Ware's sons actually joined the number two construction battalion, the only all-black battalion in the Canadian military history. There were a lot of legends about John Ware, most focused on his skill with cattle and horses. Many of the stories were likely exaggerations, but they all show just how respected and in awe of Ware his peers were. Um, some of the legends are that he would walk over the backs of Penn steers. <clears throat> that <laughs> you're just trying to picture that? that this big hulking guy hopping on the backs <laughs> of cows. I don't see it. <laughs> um, some say that he would wrestle a steer to the ground in order to brand it. I can believe that. <laughs> Um, He was said to be able to break the wildest horses that no one else could. Um, He, it is also said that he could flip a horse on its back in order to horseshoe it. To give you an idea, the average weight of a horse is about 544 kilograms or 1200 pounds. Yeah. And uh, also that he would flip an 18 month old steer on its back for branding. Which, again, average weight, 300 to 400 kilograms, or 660 to 880 pounds. That's a fair chunk of uh, flesh to be hefting around. (laughs) Um, Ware was seen as kind of the ideal cowboy. Good with animals, gentle of temperament, 
um, lighthearted and a hard worker. Even though there was a significant prejudice towards black people, Ware managed to make a name for himself in a career where there were a lot of names. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was the that was the cowboy era, though, wasn't it? If you, a man it was. It a was. man could make a name for himself in that community uh, just through perseverance and hard work. Well, and you would have to be doubly working hard in order to make a name as a black man in that community. Yeah, although you know, amongst cowboys, I don't think they really saw race as much. They were more well, like I, you. You were a cowboy. That that's who you were. That that is uh, your identification. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're on the bottom of the social ladder for the most part, mm -hmm. and I think it was less a matter of they didn't care, and more that they didn't really have a choice. <laughs> like, yeah. If you're working as a cowboy, you're considered to have basically hit rock bottom, for the most part. <laughs> Although, so the... you're gonna work with whoever you're gonna get a job with yeah and if that person happens to be black can you really be picky no no it's true and um it, it's interesting though you know you mentioned that it's kind of like the bottom of the bottom for in terms of job choices mm -hmm. but guys who took on that life stayed in that life yeah you know even though they could make some money and and whatnot they didn't tend to go hmm i'm gonna better my situation <laughs> well in that that's a good point and i i think there's also uh, a reason why cowboys are so mythologized in our culture now uh, aside from the hyper masculinity aspect there's also this kind of uh pioneering image that we have of them mm -hmm. um, and we tend to mythologize pioneers quite a bit and they were kind of the last pioneers in a lot of ways yeah because after them uh like even the the cowboy um, kind of yeah. uh, that mystique drifted away with the coming of the railroad. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's so and, and and then that led into our modern world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. Like just this idea of of the cowboy, and it, it was such a brief period of time too. Like, it's really only from about the end of the Civil War to the early 20th century. Like, an early, early 20th century. Like, around 1905 or so, when you really stop seeing these uh, free-range ranchers. Yeah. Yeah, you're after right. after that... It's, it's literally a 40-year period of time. Yeah. And that's yeah. The, the same period that we identify with the Wild West. Yeah, Exactly. Uh, and, and also, that's the kind of the end of the fur trade era in in uh, Canada, eighteen uh, eighties. Yeah, eighteen um, sixties was kind of the peak of that era, the fur trade, uh, the voyageur era, if you will. And by the eighteen eighties, it's pretty much done. Cities are starting to be founded as far west as Alberta, mm -hmm. which. I mean, yeah, there were cities in BC that were older because it was accessible by coast, <laughs> but Alberta's pretty much the kind of the end of the really easily settled territories in Canada outside of Okanagan. Yeah, well, you're tucked right up against the Rocky Mountains. That was the yeah. that was the sort of the pass, impassable, um, the, the, uh, yeah, the and, wall, so to speak, of Western Canada. And until we got a railway through there, it kind of remained that way. That's right. Um, and there are all sorts of stories I could tell you about the railway and about how that affected settlement in uh, British Columbia, which might say for another story. Uh, in fact, a whole story about kind of the oldest Sikh temple in Canada being founded in British Columbia because of the railway. Yeah. And the uh, logging camps. Yeah. Um. In uh, there's a number of locations in uh, southern Alberta named after John Ware. Uh, we have Mount Ware, Ware Creek, John Ware Ridge, John Ware Junior High School in Calgary, and the John Ware Building at SAIT, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, 
which is also home of the Four Nines Dining Center. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no. That's pretty cool. That's where it is. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you, you probably had to look far and wide to find an, uh, a, a Canadian of, of African descent, um, <laughs> you know, in, in that p- time period. Uh, be, in Alberta, in, especially. In Alberta being successful. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and it's like we have a lot of stories about black Canadians, but most of them are Eastern Canadian. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, there's a significant community in New Brunswick. Yeah. Um, um, also in Ontario. Right. Uh, because that's where a lot of the black slaves would have been in Canada through the at the under- time when he had slavery. Right. Through the Underground uh, Railroad as well. That's where most of the... Most of them would land. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it, so it so most of them are going to be from Eastern Canada, although they weren't unheard of out here, obviously, because we have John Ware. <laughs> yeah, no, well, um, it, but, it, it probably, um, like you said, about fifteen percent of the uh, of the uh, cattlemen would have. Yeah, been. it was much yeah. less in Canada, much much less. Mm-hmm. Um, Ware was pretty unique. He he got a lot of looks where when he went places, but. He, even in newspapers at the time, talk about how he was the best cowboy in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And they weren't saying that because he was black. They were saying that in spite of the fact he was black. Yeah, (laughs) just because it was true. (laughs) Exactly. Which I think Um, is is exactly what, you know, I mean, that story, I know Laura had researched because we were going to do an episode for Black History Month in February. Yeah. Which we missed entirely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, and I think that's the whole point behind, uh, you know, Black History Month is that yeah. you, you want to reach a point as a culture where a person is, a person is considered good at something just because they're good at something, not because yeah. it's remarkable that they were black and good at something. And <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think, uh, Part of why we have things like Black History Month and why it's uh, I wanted to do this episode is because um, it's not that there weren't remarkable black people in history. It's that nobody wrote about them. That's right. They were History is very white. <laughs> history is always written by the uh, by the by the, the victors conquerors. or the conquerors. <laughs> right. And in this yeah. case, in, in the case of uh, North Americans uh, who who were people of color, um, <laughs> many of them uh, were here under duress. <laughs> yeah, they weren't here because they wanted to be. No, our, our initial, well, if you even look, you know, past uh, the, the black community, if you look at the Asian community, if you yep. look at the Sikh community, many of them uh, uh, came for work on the railroad or came for work mm-hmm. on the ranches and basically were given the worst jobs yep. um, and died by the bucket load and yep. are not remembered. Mm-hmm. You know, no record of them even having uh, come or gone. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quite, it's, it's the great tragedy of history is how many stories are lost just because we didn't think they were worth writing down at the time. Yeah. Luckily, some stories survive like this one. And uh, an Albertan director named Cheryl uh, Cheryl Fago is making a documentary called John Ware Reclaimed, um, which is all about John Ware. And she's going looking for descendants of people who knew him, um, family members, and trying to compile a much more comprehensive documentary about him. So when that comes out, I would strongly recommend checking it out. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, literature that... uh that's available on that topic just give me a second because i just have to pull up my notes here um oh i know my wife had a book about him i just can't remember what it was called oh here it is um Nope, I don't. I don't have a the yeah. name of the book. It, I'll, uh, you can add it oh, on the. Uh, 
notes on yeah, the... Yeah, check uh, the description of this episode. It'll yeah. be in there. Because I'm pretty sure we still have it out. I just have to go check what the name is. Yeah. I just, You know, it's just interesting to me that, um, you know, yeah, in order to find these stories, so much more work has to go into it than if you're going to, uh, you know, old, you know, Colonel Tom something or other from, you know, you, you got yeah. bucket loads of information about the people and you have to pick oh, and choose yeah. what when you When I was use. trying to find a story of a black woman from Canada, just mm-hmm. a black woman, it wasn't even looking for a specific black woman. Um, I could really only find a handful of stories that were more than like a paragraph long. And one of them was a woman who was charged with arson. So the only reason we even know as much as we do is because it was criminal. entered into court record. Yeah. Well, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. She was oh. a she was a former slave and burned her former master's house down while he was still inside it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well deserved. <laughs> well deserved. That, that um. it was quite a controversial case because a lot of people are like, oh, should we charge her? Yeah. <laughs> Can we blame her? Like well, I don't know. I... <laughs> I mean, uh, considering the indignities done to many of the uh, uh, slave, particularly oh, female yeah. slaves. And especially the women. Yeah. Um, it was much worse for them because not only were they black, they were women. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had um, no no voice whatsoever. None at all. And that was the problem trying to find uh, on our, our last episode there. Mm-hmm. Um, Rose Fortune. Right is that almost nothing's written about her. And she was considered quite a figure in her community. And there's, like, even less written about her than there is about John Ware. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, on that note... (laughs) Yeah, short episode today. Short episode. Um, But, I, like I said, with these stories, it's a lot harder to find... uh, uh, depth of information that you would get like you said researching colonel tom tom jangleson from yeah i don't know london yeah yeah exactly (laughs) exactly Um, but yeah thanks for joining us and uh i'll try to have something weird for us for next time Uh, something a little less historic a little more wacky well we'll have to we'll have to check it out with your new job and stuff here oh too damn busy Tell you what, two weeks, I'll have some. All right, an episode every two weeks. I might hold you I, to that, buddy. I, I think I can manage two weeks. There we go. <laughs> I've go, had a break. I've had a bit of time to adjust. Yeah. So. I go through podcast withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> All righty. All righty, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and uh, keep your eyes open. You take care. Economicon is a production of Crossing Clay Studios. We can be found on Twitter at Canuckonomicon, and you can contact us through email at Canuckonomicon at gmail.com. Please be sure to share us with your friends and family, and keep your eyes open.